to uh, this uh, session. And uh, before that, I would like to thank Dr. Anafis Abdel Hafiz, Dr. Mohamed Al Girni, for the uh, organization of such a successful event and for the kind uh, invitation. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, go for this uh, session titled "The Optimal Care for Women with Triple Negative Cancer," and it's, uh, it gives me a great privilege to moderate uh, this uh, session with my dear friend, Dr. Shad Al Khayyat, Associate Professor of Medicine and uh, Medical Oncology in the Department of Medicine, King Abdulaziz uh, University. Uh, we'll have uh, a group of distinguished speakers in this uh, uh, session local and international, and we'll go without further ado to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Peter Schmidt. Uh, uh, Peter uh, Schmidt is a uh, 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 center lead, Center of Experimental Cancer Medicine, Parts Cancer Institute in London, uh, UK. Uh, Dr. Uh, Schmidt will uh, uh, do two presentations titled Treatment Options for Triple Negative uh, in Breast Cancer, and uh, also he will continue on the role of immune therapy in advanced triple negative uh, breast uh, cancer. Uh, so we'll have uh, a special session for questions and answers at the end of the session. Uh, so enjoy the uh, presentation of uh, Professor Peter Schmidt. It's a pleasure being with you virtually today, unfortunately not in person, to talk to you about the really exciting uh, progress we have been making in the treatment of triple negative breast cancer. Before I start, please note my disclosures. It has been a challenge for many, many years to really improve the way we treat triple negative breast cancer. And one of the reasons is that triple negative breast cancer is not really one subtype. It's a, it's a mixed bag of subgroups of breast cancer that all share the same characteristic that they're hormone receptor negative and HER2 negative. But as you are well aware, it's a very heterogeneous group. There are four, there are possibly six, there are possibly even more subtypes of triple negative breast cancer. And when we try to classify them by gene expression subtypes, it is, it is a really interesting exercise because it shows us that there are distinct groups within triple negative breast cancer with very different biology. For example, here in the Baylor classification, we have two basal type tumors, one immune activated, one immune suppressed, a mesenchymal group, and a luminal AR group. But what is becoming increasingly clear is that as interesting as those subtyping exercises are in terms of making us understand the biology of triple negative breast cancer, they're probably going to have very limited value going forward in terms of treatment options. And my impression is that we are more moving towards subgroups defined by therapeutic strategies. And I've listed the main strategies being explored at the moment on the right side, which include immune therapy, which include PARP inhibitors, antibody drug conjugates at the moment, also AKT inhibitors and still antiandrogens. And what is really interesting is that each of those treatment strategies is trying to tackle a different subpopulation of triple negative breast cancer or has also tackling a different, a different target on cancer cells. And as you can see for immune therapy, at least at the moment, it is all around pdl one expression. For PARP inhibitors, again, at the moment, this is around germline mutations of BRCA1 and BRCA2, but we can talk how this may change over time. Antibody drug conjugates are very interesting because there's a number of new targets being explored, TROP2 most established, but I will briefly men, um, uh, mention HER2, where we have really exciting new data, for example, with DSA201 or HER3, again, where, where HER3, where exciting data are coming through. Live on another exciting target. Now, what is interesting when we talk about antibody drug conjugates, and again, that's credit to the latest development in the technology, we no longer need to select an oncogenic driver. What does that mean? Well, in the past, if you go back to HER2 positive breast cancer, we developed antibody drug conjugates, ADCs targeting HER2, which is a large oncogenic driver. But what we've learned now, it's no, not necessarily required that this 
target we're choosing for the ADC drives breast cancer biology. It just needs to be an anchor of the cancer cells and allows us to give a treatment that has a very localized effect. And therefore, I would expect to see substantial, really important developments taking place in the development of antibody drug conjugates. Another point that it's important to make, and that's making our life very difficult when we try to summarize this, it talks is that each of those treatment groups, treatment populations, is not necessarily a distinct entity. In other words, the subgroups defined, for example, by PD1 or by BRCA mutations are largely overlapping. And so we will struggle to say in this say, say that this is a PD1 positive tumor or there's a German and BRCA tumor. We may end up in a situation in the future where we say this is triple negative breast cancer, PD1 positive. BRCA germline mutation drop too high, an androgen receptor low with a PIK3CA mutation and, 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 and P10 intact. And that will allow the oncologist to select the appropriate treatments going forward. Now, when we look at the management of triple negative breast cancer, <clears throat> I would go back to 2018 and, and, and it will work out over time of my talk how these treatment options have really developed over the last three or four years. Now, in, in triple negative breast cancer, we are increasingly going away from operating first and then giving atuin chemotherapy to giving neoatuin treatment first, followed by atuin, by, by surgery, possibly atuin strategy. And there's a huge debate ongoing whether or not patients should receive platinum, and we are not going to answer that debate today. Although I personally sit in the platinum camp and would say if you have a treatment that's substantially more effective with limited toxicity and we can manage that very well and it's actually cheap and easily accessible, why would you not incorporate that into a neoadjuvant treatment regimen? But by giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we can divide patients into two groups. There's a group of patients who achieves a path CR, and that is around 35 to maximum 40% with anthracycles and taxanes. If you add in platinum, it goes up to 50, even 55%. And that group has a fantastic outlook with a 90, 95%, three or five years disease-free survival. However, the other patients who do not achieve a PASIA who have residual cancer, unfortunately have a very high risk of recurrence with up to 40, 50% over the first three years. And as you're aware, there are two exciting developments and you will hear about this in subsequent talks about, for example, Cape Cytopene chemotherapy or possibly platinum in that setting, but also more recently with the Olympia trial with Olaparab in patients with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, which all can substantially reduce the risk of recurrence in these high-risk patients. Now, how can we improve and can we actually improve cure rates in patients who do have, a, a, do have residual cancer? And I already mentioned this very briefly to you, Cape Cytopene has clearly shown a hazard ratio of around 0.52 in patients with triple negative breast cancer. And again, with Olaparib as a PARP inhibitor, we see very impressive results with a hazard ratio of 0.58 risk reduction with the addition of Olaparib in patients who did not achieve a path CR with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this is going to become the new standard in those patients. But the other important question is, is there a way for us to improve the path CR rates in this setting. And one of the key steps forward, in my opinion, is the introduction of immune therapy in this setting. You're aware of the two large phase three trials, the larger one, Keynote 522, shows a very intensive chemotherapy backbone, anthracycline, taxanes, platinum, and with and without immune therapy, and looking at event-free survival and path CR rates. There's a second trial, slightly smaller, in Passion 031, using platinum-free combinations are slightly less effective with a tessalism up all the way through, only looking at, 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 at path CR rates. And the trial populations were relatively similar, slightly more high-risk patients in Keynote 522. Now, if you look at the path CR rates, the complete disappearance at the time of surgery, both trials are positive, remarkably positive. They're pushing path CR rates from 51% with the platinum-based chemotherapy to nearly 65% to two, and with a slightly less effective chemo backbone from 41% to 57 in Passion 031. There are two interesting subgroups worthwhile mentioning. One is looking at node positive versus node negative patients, and the other one is looking at PD-1 expression. So let's start with node positive versus node negative patients. 
you're well aware that patients who have no positive disease have a much lower path CR rates with chemotherapy uh, compared to patients who have no nodal involvement. And we see the same in those two phase three trials. But what is really interesting, when we add in immune therapy, we can completely change the prognosis of patients with no positive disease. As you can see in, in red patients with chemotherapy alone, clearly no positive, have a lower response rate as no negative patients. But when we add in immune therapy, the puff CR rate is the same whether patients are no positive or no negative, such as they're very high benefit in patients with no positive disease. Interestingly, we saw exactly the same in PASHA 031. Again, note positive patients with immune therapy do as well as no negative patients. And that's a really interesting phenomenon which we can discuss what the biology behind there may be the case. But the really important question is, do, does this benefit in puff CR it's translate into a long-term recurrent risk uh, reduction in, in, in terms of recurrences? And, 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 and the, the jury is, is still out there, but I will share very interesting data with you in a second. We also have learned from the metastatic setting that patients with PD1 positive tumors seem to derive a benefit of immune therapy, whereas patients with PD1 negative tumors do not. Now, this is very different in early tubal negative breast cancer. If you look at patients with PD1 positive or PD1 negative tumors, on the left, you see PD1 negative. And then in the other three uh, sections of the chart are different levels of PD1 positivity. But what you can see very easily is irrespective of what assay you use, irrespective of what cutoff you use, patients with, no, uh, with PD1 positive or PD1 negative disease seem to derive a similar benefit from the addition of immune therapy to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And again, the very same was observed in the impassion 3 one trial with a different checkpoint in here, different assay, different chemotherapy backbone. So why is this the case? My interpretation is that in early breast cancer, the, the tumors are highly dynamic. The biology can change within two or three weeks. We have data where we see that two thirds of PD1 negative patients turn PD1 positive with only two or three weeks of chemo or immune therapy. And therefore, in, in, in early disease for puff CR, it doesn't seem to be relevant whether patients are PD1 positive or PD1 negative. What do we know about long term outcome in these patients? The first data we presented two years ago showed that with a short follow up of 15 months and early separation of the curves, hazard ratio 0.63, impressive p value, but it did not meet the, the predefined boundaries for significance at that time. There was a second a data set presented at the FDA very early this year, with now with nearly two and a half, just over two years follow up. And again, you see the curve stabilized. Hazard ratio 0.65, 7% difference in, in, in nearly in disease free survival. And again, just missed out in terms of significance. But many of you may have seen the press release, which, which, which we issued a few weeks ago, that now with the next interim analysis, we have reached statistical significance, demonstrating clearly that the addition of immune therapy to neoadjuvant chemotherapy improves long term outcome significantly reduces event-free survival. And you will see the data coming up at one of the uh, big conferences very, very soon. What is also interesting is the question, does everyone respond similarly or benefit similarly to immune therapy? And we looked in particular at patients who, had, who did not achieve a puff CR, whether their outlook is the same if they received immune therapy or not. And as you can see from those early data, a look at the two lower curves, which are the patients who did not achieve a path CR. Even if you don't have a path CR, you seem to be doing better with the addition of immune therapy in this setting. And that is really encouraging. And we will need to follow this up with, 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 in, in the next analysis. So where are we heading in early triple negative breast cancer? One of the big themes at the moment is, do we need to treat everyone that aggressively? And in stage one disease, we are actively discussing de-escalation strategies, possibly to stratified by TILS, where, for example, combination, chemo-free combinations may be an option for clinical trials in the future, where we could consider chemotherapy only in patients with non puff CR. In stage two and three disease, we will look into how we best tailor those strategies 
explore further whether platinum is needed in all patients and work a little bit on identifying optimal responders, maybe with the help of TILS or PDL1. And, and, and but, but really, the new standard will be chemotherapy and immune therapy based on the data I just shared with you. What we will have to look into is what we can do in patients with. Uh, with, with, with PUFSI and non PUFSI, and patients do really well. Do they really need to continue on active and immune therapy? And I would hope that the follow up of 5 to 2 will help us a little bit to, to define this better. But in patients with residual disease, you've already heard capecitabine, platinum can work, but also we've seen the, the, the Oliparab data. But we are looking into new combinations with immune therapy and possibly antibody drug conjugates. Now, what happens in the treatment setting when patients unfortunately have disease recurrence? And again, going back to 2018, in the first line setting, the standard of care used to be taxanes or platinum, which have shown similar efficacy in a randomized phase three trials in some part of the world with or without bevacizumab. Second line, capecitabine or aribolin, and often in the third line setting, we ran out of options relatively quickly, especially if patients have been treated intensively in the first line setting with anthracyclines, with in, in the neoadjuvant setting with anthracyclines, with taxanes, with platinum, with capecitabine. And so only about three years ago, the median overall survival was still only around 12 to 15 months. What I want to share with you in the next seven, eight minutes is really how we're changing this and how much better triple negative breast cancer patients are doing now. A lot of this is based around this slide I already shared with you, trying to tailor the treatment options and, 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 and divide triple negative breast cancer into different therapeutic treatment strategy disease populations, PD1 positive, BRCA germinal mutations, just to mention a few, and I will go through some of those groups in a minute. If you start with patients with BRCA germinal mutations, you've seen very clearly from two phase three trials, which were a mixed bag, here positive, triple negative, but also first, second, third line, but we saw very clearly that PARP inhibitors do provide a better efficacy compared to platinum-free chemotherapy with a hazard ratio around 0 0.58, 0 0.54, and, and really interesting and promising response data. We also know that platinum has in those BRCA mutation carriers very similar response data, and we, and we haven't seen a clear survival benefit. What I think is interesting around PARP inhibitors is that they maintain a lot of their activity, at least in terms of response. And we see similarly high response rates in first, second, and third line setting, which will allow you to consider this when you, when, when you sequence drugs in the most effective way. There are also interesting new data coming through around activity with PARP inhibitors in patients with other mutations, not BRCA1 or BRCA2 germline mutations, and this could be a germline mutation, for example, of PALB2, or it could be a somatic mutation of BRCA1. And you can see there a response rate in the range of 30 to 40%, which is encouraging and warrants further investigation, may hopefully over time widen the indication for PARP inhibitors, but not yet outside clinical trials. I will talk about immune therapy in more detail in a minute, but just to, to share the top lines here, we have two phase three trials, well, in the first line setting with chemotherapy with and without immune therapy. And, 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 and both trials looked at progression-free and overall survival, showing a substantial benefit in progression-free survival, but only in patients with pd one positive tumors. And we can discuss this a bit more in detail in my second presentation. If you look at the third area where we have made massive progress, and this is the area of antibody drug conjugates, and I've selected sagituzumab as an example because it is the only drug that's currently approved. But you will have seen there are really exciting data coming through with other ADCs. For example, the ES1062, which also targets job 2 has shown very high activity in, 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 in pre-treated triple negative breast cancer. They've even seen some activity in patients who are stuck in Tuzumab pre-treated. You will have seen some of the data with DSA201, which targets HER2, where we've seen encouraging activity in patients with low HER2 expression. You may have seen an interesting activity with LIV1, another ADC, in combination with immune therapy, and again, providing encouraging data for, for, for bigger trials. But Sagituzumab is already licensed in the US and will be licensed in other parts of the world very soon. It targets job two, 
which is probably not a, a, a terribly important protein, but it's frequently expressed on cancers, including triple negative breast cancer. And the new technology of these ADCs really pack more active drug into the cancer, but also finds better ways of releasing this. So these drugs are no, not, no longer required to be fully internalized to have their activity. When we look at the first phase one data with Sagituzumab two or three years ago, what I found impressive was there's a substantial number of patients who had an objective response and did do well for quite some time with an objective response of about 33% in patients with heavily pretreated at least two prior lines of therapy. And if you wonder whether this is patient selection, look at the left half of the slide now, where in red you see the pre immediate prior therapy, which was chemotherapy generally in those patients. And in blue, you see how long patients stayed in sagituzumab. And if you just go down, for example, choose the third patient from above, she clearly pro progressed on the immediate prior therapy, but then stayed on sagituzumab for more than two years, showing it's a highly effective therapy, even in heavily pretreated patients. So it wasn't a surprise that when the ASCEND phase three trial was finally presented at the end of last year, which compared sagituzumab with treatment of physician's choice in, in patients who failed at least two lines of therapy, that we saw a clear benefit. Primary employee progression-free survival, massive benefit, medium from 1.7 up to 5.6, hazard ratio of 0.41, and that seems to be in all relevant subgroups. What is really interesting is also what I want to emphasize here, is the differences in response rates. Now, response rates, we don't look at them that often anymore in metastatic disease, but I think they're really important because if you have a patient with third or subsequent line treatment who has lots of symptoms, if they have a very active treatment with high responses, they will symptomatically improve. And if you look at the responses, 35% compared to 5% only with chemotherapy, you can see this is a big leap forward in the management of pretreated patients with triple negative breast cancer. And it wasn't a surprise that this also led to a doubling in overall survival compared to standard chemotherapy from six to 12 months. New standard of care, third and subsequent line, and we're working on bringing this possibly into early lines of therapy. Now the next story around AKT inhibitors is an interesting question, and the short answer is to two result what role AKT inhibitors will play in triple negative breast cancer. But there were two randomized phase two trials the first line setting chemo with and without AKT inhibitors, both showed remarkably similar results, both improving overall survival by around six months compared to chemotherapy alone. But what was also interesting, our initial data suggested that most of those benefit is seen in patients with certain mutations, PIK3CA, AKT, or P10, uh, as you can see on the left side, where the hazard ratio was 0.37 compared to on the right side without mutations. But when we did an update of those data last year, we saw actually the biomarker story seems to be not panning out with more follow-up and patients seem to be doing similarly well whether they have those mutations or not. The same was observed in the second phase two trial where in fact patients with alterations probably didn't seem to have a benefit in the phase two trials where patients without alteration still seem to carry the benefits Obviously, huge caveat, all small numbers. Why am I going on about this? Because the first phase three trial was reported in San Antonio just a few months ago. And this was again a first line triple negative breast cancer study, but only in patients with mutations PIK3CA, AKT, or P10, based on the early data from our phase two trials, which then didn't come through. And this trial, as you probably have heard, is completely negative for progression-free survival. But there are still a few important considerations. The first thing, obvious, the biomarker may have been suboptimal, and we need to see how patients do who are biomarker negative. But we also haven't got survival data. And the data in, with phase two trials really show most of the benefit in terms of overall survival relative to progression-free survival. So there's a big trial ongoing, Capitello 2. 90 with around 800 patients. I can only encourage you to support this trial because it will address all these open questions and hopefully show us that patients with triple negative breast cancer may benefit from, from, from AKT inhibitor. 
Now to wrap this up, where are we with triple negative breast cancer management now in 2021 and 2022? And it is very clear we have a new standard of care in the metastatic setting, chemotherapy and immune therapy combinations. We have PARP inhibitors now in first, second, third lines, BRCA germline mutated cancers. We also have PARP inhibitors in the post knee artery one setting and in the artery one setting, which you will hear in a minute in, the, in one of the next talks. We will have, we can talk about whether immune therapy plays a role in, in, in later line single agent AKT inhibitors, the jury is still out, Sagituzumab, third and subsequent line, new standard of care, and, and with, with interesting new data to come. We still have antiandrogens in selected patients, and we also, in my opinion, will change the standard of care very soon in the knee adjuvant setting, adding immune therapy to chemotherapy. So the treatment options are becoming brighter, are becoming more effective, and I think we, we are really on the verge of changing the way we're treating triple negative breast cancer, but also improving their outlook long term. Thank you very much. Sorry, Dr. Peter, are you going to the second talk directly? Say that again. Are you going to the second talk? Um, you got the second talk. Do you want me to have a discussion now? Or? Uh, no, I think we're just going to leave the discussion until the end of the uh, of the uh, like of the whole session. So if it's okay well, with you to stay with us, that will be better. I can't stay to the end of the whole session. I can't stand. I can stay at the end of my talk. Okay, that's fine. So we can proceed for the questions right now. I okay. did not receive yeah questions yet. So uh, just I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Can we have the questions after the two presentations? Uh, yeah, I yeah. think Dr. Peter in a short time and he needs to run, isn't that right? But I can have after the second talk, absolutely. Let's do the second yeah. talk. We may sure. have a discussion after afterwards. the second talk then. Okay, yeah. yes. thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Please start. It's a pleasure to, for me to give you a second presentation now, specifically on the role of immune therapy in an advanced triple negative breast cancer. The interaction of the immune system with the cancer is a very complex process. It's very different to, for example, giving 